Welcome to the uh, 54th edition of Airhex TV with lots of topics. So um, now switch first to a little bit marketing, but a good news, uh, we have um, on average, I would say five to eight attendees for every slot um, of the workshops at Airport Munich, and they take place in November, December. So if you're interested, interested uh, please hurry. Otherwise, uh, sitting is limited. And why is limited? Because Airport Munich asked me to give them the largest available room, and they were really nice to me in 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 um, in the past. So they got you know the huge room. So we have one smaller room. So um, there, the scalability might be an issue. Okay. So now, next news are there is a next episode of the Airhex uh, FM uh, podcast available, and this was. Uh, an interview or conversation with Elder Moraes from Brazil. And uh, the backstory is Elder asked me, I don't know, uh, almost one year ago about a short interview because he needed some, some material for a conference speak. And Elder also invited me to a Java One talk last, last year at Java One. And um, I said, okay, what we could do, we could ask me whatever you like in a freestyle conversation because I have no time, you know, to have. Uh, to, to write uh, lots of emails back and forth. And so we, we did the, uh, uh, the podcast and I ask, asked him one question, he asked me a question and um, this podcast is uh, uh, quite popular, I would say. So the download size, are, uh, the download uh, numbers are really uh, excellent. So uh, thank you for listening to Airhex FM. So next one. So we covered this and this and now start with the topics. So let's ask me, and this is a really good question, and the answer, answer is also really simple. Uh, so let's ask me a question, where to put uh, or how to organize the reports? And this is a really interesting question because uh, even in the Green Book and a few years ago, I always uh, made the, the, the uh, distinction between domain-driven or domain-driven, yeah, domain type category projects or um, or reports like, or uh, how it's called, transaction script like projects. This is the proper name, transaction script. This is the pattern. And what's the distinction? Well, in uh, domain uh, projects, you are more interested in orders or uh, customers, as so you are building packages and entities around the concepts. And if you are building something with reports, you are not interested in the domain package or object and more you are interested in uh, in the report itself. So you could actually have one report package for everything because uh, a report could contain whatever you like. So you are, this, you are actually, you are creating and designing and organizing reports and no more orders, customers, or whatever. In uh, some uh, projects, oh, some projects, some years ago and some projects ago, um, we created uh, a... a, a a reporting system with uh, with a report editor even and uh, so what we had we had a report we had a table we had a view but you couldn't find customers for instance for that so what you could have is you could have you know uh, components uh, named order client shopping cart um, and then on the same level you can have one single package called reports with boundary control entity and this report can have reports resource, and if you would like to design uh, reports, even uh, um, reports design or reports or templates, better templates. So um, think about that. So I don't think it makes a lot of sense to mix reports and business objects in one package on one business component. I would like, I would more split it in apart. So this would be the uh, the approach. Um, so no sub packages, rather than you know you have a report generic report package for all the reports inside your project and then have packages or, or or components for each business concept i hope it's clear so next one um angular front end talks to jaxrs backend which is good and now he asked me okay uh what happens then is he he sends a a token so i i, I used a json web token for that so the name json web token but it can be any token you like. So um, the token actually, it's uh, the token um, impersonates the user. So the token is actually the user. So it can be compared to a session. 
and he would like to keep the token in the relational database. And now the question is, uh, which caching solution would you propose to handle large, large numbers of users in clustered environment? And the question is, what is large? So are you talking about, about millions, billions, or thousands? Usually thousands, thousands of users is not a problem at all. So just imagine if, we, if you would have, uh, let's say, several thousand requests per second, then you get several thousand tokens per second, which can be, which would be read from a database, and uh, usually the access would be by index. So I don't think it it would be slow. Having said that, um, if you are using something like Keycloak from um, from uh, Red Hat or uh, or JBoss, then uh, Whitefly is what I wanted to say. Um, so what uh, Keycloak comes with, it already uh, has integrated caching solution in Finispan. So I think in Finispan would be great caching solution because there are, you have key value pairs or Hazelcast or something like that. But I don't think you really need a caching solution here. I would just stick without a cache and, and, and create a proper stress test and see how your application behaves. If there is a need for, for cache, then, then introduce a cache. Otherwise, what will happen, I guarantee you, you will introduce a cache, which is probably not needed. And if it's not needed, you get, uh, you know, memory issues in, in one point of time, or you will have to think about, you know, uh, how large is the cache and how is this a last recent, uh, least recently used strategy or most recently used strategy. And um, so I would rather, you know, skip the cache, perform stress testing uh, with several thousand different tokens a second and see how your solution behaves. The next one, also interesting, managed as a scheduled executor service. And I wrote a blog post about the managed execu uh, scheduled ex executor service. So if you go here and search for a new tab, so this is actually the blog post about that. And the question is, um, fail over in clustered environment. I would say the time of clustered environment is almost over. So what I do in my projects for a long time is I'm using just standalone containers, uh, containers, yeah, application servers running in Docker containers, which are uh, load balanced by, for instance, HA proxy, or in my current projects, OpenShift, also HA proxy, but this is not visible to you. And uh, but um, what you still will have the problem, what you would like to to have is that the EJB timer fires once per service. How to achieve that? So in OpenShift, what you, for instance, or OpenShift cloud native environment, this is what I wanted to express. So if you have a cloud native environment, what you could do, you could have a dedicated um, timer or scheduler service which runs outside the cluster. And uh, then uh, it is itself, it just pings the, the, um, the clustered microservice. This could be a solution. I actually created something like this for, for some clients. Um, and um, and if you just have to use the cluster and say, I, I don't care about cloud native, I just uh, am very happy with my clustered solution, then the tie, uh, the scheduler annotation has one, um, one setting and it's called uh, persistence true or false. And this persistent true or false, if you set it to persistent, the timer is going to be stored in a database. The question is which one? So for Glassfish or Payara, you will have to create a central table and all the whole cluster will co coordinate against the table. Exactly, this is Payara and take a look in Payara lib, I think config, and you will find EGB timers as SQL or something. If you search for that, you will, you will find the DDL. Um, exactly, with managed scheduled executor service, it's a little bit harder because I'm not sure whether the schedule is maintained in the um, in the database, uh, what you will need in either case is uh, like a shared singleton where uh, one server says now now I'm firing and uh, the other one wait until I die. So you always will need a kind of master slave uh, scenario. Okay. The next one really interesting SSR seven. Uh, I think is a kind of spy or special a special agent, Mr. SSR seven. Um, he says hi Adam. I want to start a project that stores files on a network. So what I what I understand from that is that uh, he would like to have a distributed store because he also writes each node shares his hard disk, uh, 10, 10 gigabyte, and, and client 
has a coin can be up can a coin is I think is like proof of work or he has buy the coin somewhere or is it like um, um, credential and um, so it is like distributed storage and uh, I would say it uh, what I think about this is um, yeah the rate array a distributed hard disk and the question is now is the actor model good for the project he would like to implement such a thing and 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 what you will choose aka vertex or other so first if i will build something like this i wouldn't care about actors at all what i will care a lot in the in first place is uh, find the right light algorithm so i would think about for instance merkle tree um or what is a merkle tree or or something like this um or a consistent hashing algorithm really performant one what it does is um i will have to find you know if i have a snippet of the file I will have to find uh, the 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 content. I will have to know where the content lives. So this is the main challenge. So and now think about the problem. So what you will get? Let's say you get several thousand requests from your users, and the users would like to find the content in millions of disks. So you will get a lots of small messages, and the messages are dispatched to the proper client. So you will need something like a dispatcher who looks at the request and your coin, whatever in the coin you get encoded where the content lives and it's like a load balance and will balance to the hard disk and the hard disk will will return probably or stream back directly to the client, hopefully, uh, the content. So um, you will get a lot of parallel requests and lots of threats, uh, threats. So you get kind of a um, message solution. So uh, for message solution, ACA might be good. Um, the problem what, what you what, to solve here is um, if the client if the uh, waits until the other client wakes up and becomes available, you cannot block the threat. So you can even use stock JAXRS or stock WebSockets or stock Java 7, but you will always have to suspend the uh, threat uh, or park the threat, which happens out of the box on stock application servers. So. I would, of course, at least experiment with stock application server first and see what happens. I, I don't know what you are building, you know, if, whether you would like to take over the world with that. I, um, are, are you trying, you know, to uh, to compete with Dropbox, for instance? Then probably um, I would look and see or go programming language or assembler or something like this. But um, if this is just, you know, your if you have, uh, let's say, uh, several hundred users, then it really doesn't matter what you are using. So I will, of course, start with um, Java E. Why? Because it's simple. You download the server and then you can focus on business logic. And uh, if it's not fast enough or doesn't scale, you can still migrate to whatever you like. But if you will start with a uh, domain-specific framework, I guarantee you, you will spend you know one to two days to, to play with the framework until you implement something reasonable um, or, or the added value to your users. So if you if this is your pet project, go with Aka Vertex or whatever you like or, or heard on conferences. So if this is like a business project, I will more focus on business logic. And uh, however, I will have to say in your case, uh, for me, it is still like um, messaging solution and even um, and even um, not publish, subscribe, rather than uh, fire and forget. Um, fire and forget a messaging solution. So I think um, Aka or Vertex might be actually a good solution um, because yeah, it is. It sounds to me like small messages which are, are sent back and forth. But if it is not, so like uh, you are just hitting an API, then I will go for sure with stock Java E. Okay, Airhex alumni, ask me. How do you validate the database schema during startup? So I'm actually not validating uh, the schema on startup, and or actually I'm usually not doing that. So um, if I have to migrate schemas, we use FlywayDB. FlywayDB. This is my favorite tool because it's simple. Liquibase is also available. It's uh, a little bit more powerful, but I I think FlywayDB is just great. And um, what we did in a FET client project, for instance, we maintained uh, the database schema version and we maintained the client version. And if they didn't match, we just didn't start the client. 
So this is what I did once. I never use integri integrity checker with Eclipse Link, but by the way, what Eclipse Links is also able to do is absolutely able to write the uh, DDL files. Um, and I actually used that in the workshops and also used um, prepare the examples. So what happens then? You can write the D you can you can tell Eclipse Link either create the tables or write the DDL, so data definition uh, language files, or like the uh, create table files, or create create table statements into a file or system out print line, and we use that as an input as an input to um, um, uh, for for the next iteration. Uh, so uh, and I had no no time to look at your rate re limiting uh, on your rate limiting implementation, but it already caused a lots of buzz uh, on the Twitter. So I saw that you announced that. Had no time no no time um, no time to look at that. But uh, um, as you say, this is, I wouldn't use this approach uh, for a Netflix scale. I think no one of us is on Netflix projects uh, scale projects to maintain. If it has, is always specific solution to that um, but with 500 to 100 requests per second um, yeah um, if I will time I will take a look at that so next one uh, so listeners if you like take a look at this please um, and um, and um, if you yeah give feedback to Rick Pill I, I will take a look at this but I already saw a great feedback on Twitter so I think you are on the right path even without my my review so uh, Vanua2 asked me, so ask me, it states, he uses um, Jaxareth with JSONB and uses uh, JSONB D format. And the question is uh, how to configure globally something. And what I did already is if you look at JSOND format, and I would like to open a new tab, you see that you can annotate package. So it would be enough to annotate a package, and all classes in the package would be uh, would be um, configured per default. So this is possible. What's also possible? I forgot to open that. Is JSON B Jux RS configuration? You can use a context resolver. No, this is wrong. Context resolver. Yes. What I did here, there is a provider, JSON configurator, JSONB configurator should be the name, implements context resolver. And what I did here, I implemented my private visibility strategy. So what the strategy does, it uh, it, it looks at private fields and, and takes the private fields for serialization. So you can create your own configuration for the entire application and, uh, and have your own date serializer and you will never have to reapply the Dates. So take a look at that, and I think it will help you. So either annotate the packages or use the context resolver with Chuck's rest. This is the way to, to globally configure JSONB. Cool. Next one. Slobodan Vujovic, I guess. Uh, I look at your Payara 5 Docker file. So this is from the um, Docklands project. And uh, what is inside the file is echo deploy with a really strange statement. So it says echo deploy. So echo means uh, print out the statement. And the statement is uh, go to deployment directory. Then, and this is really strange, right? So what it says is give me please the first uh, column, so the, 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 the name of the file. And if there are more words, give me just the first one. And then put that into deploy command. So the deploy command will be uh, deploy from deployment there and give me the last um, or the first file in the deployment directory and put it here. So why I did it, um, Payara disabled in one point of time this auto deployment. And what it happens here is during the Docker, uh, Docker file um, execution is uh, during the uh, running the Docker file it uh, uses the asadmin deploy command, the um, deploy command, this is here. So it uh, uses actually the Payara API to push the war to Payara and doesn't rely on auto deploy anymore. 
And um, what I usually do is, and I do it for all servers, if you look at Docklands project, whether it is uh, Payara, Whitefly, or the others, I always have one deployment there. I put the war into the deployment there and expect the server to pick up the war uh, and deploy it. So if the Py if Payara disabled um, for security reasons, I think, um, they disabled auto deploy, so, but I wanted to keep the same behavior. So what I'm doing here, I'm, I'm, I'm looking in deployment there for a war and I deploy it by myself. So this is what happens here. Okay, so Java Ninja book, Java e patterns. Thank you for that. Um, and now he has a single question, a single and good question. So pass a bulk, a bulk uh, message in one request. So how to do that? So from the technological, from the technological, from the uh, technical perspective, not a big deal. Why not? You can pass, uh, you can even upload a file using JaxOS. So we really did it, not a big problem, it, it scales really well. So you can upload and stream whatever you like, uh, even video movies, so it will work. From the conceptual perspective, also not, not, a, not, not a problem. Just imagine what could be a bulk. Let's say, let's say I would like to have, uh, oh, this is actually, I think, my work. Just imagine that our, uh, Archive, I forgot my own URI. It is block archives. This is what I wanted to have. So let's say you are implementing an archiver for a block, and this archiver, this is a this is a list of all entries for my block, and I would like to upload this at once. So if you think about this, you shouldn't model then posts. What I would model from the API perspective, I would model the archive. So in this particular case, I would have an archive as a resource, and then I can post a list, this would be a bulk message, a list of all posts, which makes absolutely sense from the API perspective. Because I'm not forced to model single posts, I can absolutely upload, I can absolutely upload you know, the entire thing, because the archive is from the business perspective, a collection of blog posts, even if even if this is everything. And from the technical perspective, it will work. Of course, the thread will block or, or the, no, no, blocked. The, the thread is going to be occupied for the duration of the transfer. But uh, yeah, it, you need a thread for, for having a, a, a streaming um, operation. So um, if, of course, I will archive, you know, the block 1000 times, I will need 1000 threads for that. Okay. Next one, and this is uh, nine hours ago. So I never saw this, uh, I never saw this, had no chance to, to read that. So, um, so I have deployed a service on some application server, uh, WebLogic, uh, alt but strong. Yes, uh, actually the very old WebLogic were great. So I really like WebLogic 8, probably 9, and then with 10, they got a little bit bigger, I would say, with more functionality, but bigger, right? So, um, programmatically, I know what will be your approach to get runtime vendors by, to get runtime errors by type. And if some threshold is touched in alert, I mean, so I don't get the question. So, uh, ah, runtime errors by type. And if some threshold is touched, then alert email to, to send to administrators. So um, what I understand is uh, the application server does not matter here. There is one microservice and the microservice throws errors. And if a threshold is, 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 uh, is reached, he would like to get notified. So what I will do. So um, let's say, okay, if you don't have modern application server, then we, you can you can go away with something else. But let's say we have Java 7, Java 8 application servers, like for instance, Open Liberty or Payara. And what you could do is you could use MicroProfile, for instance, uh, to expose metrics. And one in particular interesting metric is called gauge, G-A-U-G-E. And this is a counter. If you do this, you have to only annotate a method which returns int or long with at gauge, and um, and then it will be exposed as JSON or Prometheus format. So that's interesting. 
So, and now the question is how to know runtime errors by type. So if you introduce uh, interceptor, for instance, then the interceptor can uh, catch all your errors on the boundary level and um, and then just count the errors by type. So what you will have to do is you have to counter by type. So a hash map, concurrent hash map, a key is type and uh, the value is atomic long, hopefully not atomic integer, it should be, should be enough. So, and then you can expose that via this gauge. And then Prometheus, for instance, would scrap your, your application server every, let's say, 10 seconds. And if the threshold is reached, um, Prometheus supports alerts, and then you have your solution. Sounds simple. Um, so, if you don't have, if you, if you do not have uh, microprofile support, I don't think, think WebLogic has, then what I implemented could be interesting for you. It's called Firehose. Firehose is on GitHub. Perfect. And this is, um, it, it works with Glassfish, but you can just, you know, take over and um, make uh, some modifications. So what it does is it, it reads Glassfish uh, metrics and converts them on the fly to Prometheus metrics. So what you could do is just the um, just convert the Glassfish format or um, implement an adapter which use, for instance, JMX or whatever you have, or your REST endpoint. For instance, what you could do, you could uh, introduce on the WebLogic server, let's say, a matrix endpoint. This is your JAXRS endpoint, which exposes, uh, for instance, the uh, the runtime counters, if you don't have the gauge, and then uh, take a look at Firehost, and you will see how to convert the uh, hash map into Prometheus matrix. I hope it's crystal clear. So, next one. Oh, oh, oh man. So, I, uh, this is like, you know, last minute questions. Is it possible to configure application servers to pull resource credentials from somewhere instead of setting them statically in this, the config standalone? Uh, yes, of course, because what uh, the application servers are able to do is they have variable substitution. So this is all servers can do this. So you can have uh, and the in standalone. This is actually where where it happens. So you can create a a, a data source definition in uh, standalone, and then replace and then replace the um, the placeholders with that. So. Next one. Have you ever used GWT previously Google Web Toolkit? Does it have a future for front end development using Java? And um, or as alternative to alternative to writing front ends for Java, Jakarta E backends. Uh, I I I never used GWT by myself, but I was in project where it was used, and I even coached some projects to go went to walk away from GWT. And uh, I don't think Google Web Toolkit is a great future. Uh, even Google itself moves a little bit away from Google Web Toolkit. But there is a like you know extended future. Like for instance, Google Web Toolkit is used inside of Varden. So if I would have to use Google Web Toolkit, I would use at Varden. Um, what what I find out is that actually the modern JavaScript is very very similar to JavaFX or Java or Swing, and I'm using I'm writing right now uh, no dependency frontends with web standards. This is what I'm doing, and I don't think GWT has great future. I don't think there are lots of developers interested in GWT. I don't think uh, Google invests a lot in GWT, and I don't think the uh, Java to JavaScript converter has a great future. So, but this is, I think, yeah, this is my, my subjective opinion. And yeah. And by the way, there were a few developers uh, on the uh, workshops and EHX workshop in Munich. And if they use JWT, I always ask about the, their opinion. And there were only a few who liked that. Most of them really hated it. And the reason is the turnaround cycle. So it is really slow, you know, to, to, uh, to recompile the, the components. 
Now the very very last one. Mr. J, of course, Cro Crochavera. So, and he asked me, is there any way load unload in runtime resources endpoints contained contained in external classes? Jaxos configuration, load a class, register an instance. Uh, what does it mean more efficiently? So, do you have problem with runtime, or w what means more efficiently? And um, there, there are always proprietary features. So if you are using Jersey, there are lots of ways. The question is, do you have to use the Jaxores, Jaxores stock thing? And, and actually, I would say it is really suspicious if you have to load and unload uh, endpoints at, at, at runtime. So because uh, what we have right now, and this works really well, this is even called buzzword immutable infrastructure so even configuration changes for configuration changes we restart the server so i don't think and even if you the problem just unloading un, uh, just unloading and reloading and playing java class without jaxores and server was problematic so in the in the, in the past we had osgi and um and this was really problematic you know to load and unload classes because of resource leaks and uh and class loading problems so I, I i i don't see the added value of doing that and this even if it works efficiently uh it is it will not work robustly this is uh uh my feeling here so let's take a look at uh yeah stream is dead is alive uh, again i guess so um any questions here? Ah, the last question is, what's the weather in Munich? So in Munich was really hot, and now it is like 21 degrees Celsius. Uh, so Celsius. And yeah, it's nice. It's no more hot. It's like an autumn. But uh, and at, uh, I think at um, Munich Airport, the next workshops, the weather will be great. So hopefully snow and we have the winter market so thank you for watching and uh, gather your questions and see you next month